Hi everyone, my name is Lutlari Rikoto, but I go by VT because it's more accessible <laughs> <laughs> and cool. <laughs> um, I'm a developer here at BBD. I've been here for about six years now. In that six years, I've worked across multiple spaces, including banking and insurance. For those who work in banking and insurance, you know that one of the aims in building a product is to reach um, mainly the unbanked if you talk about banking. So you can look at it as in increasing access. But one of the challenges that come with increasing access is the issue of accessibility. Now you might ask what the difference is, but that's what my talk is about today. So in this talk, I'm going to cover what accessibility is who is affected by accessibility, why businesses should embrace accessibility features in their products, and what you and I can do to make sure that the products that we work on are more accessible. But first, I want you to lend me your Im imagination for a bit. I want you to think about the sound of laughter with your friends when you were very young. I want you to imagine the sound of rain or the sound of your mother reading you a bedtime story before bed or if you're black you might need to imagine a bit more <laughs> because they don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> now imagine if suddenly you were told that you're going to lose your hearing. Think about the things that you currently need uh, sounds for. The sound of microwave when it's done. Uh, your fridge door when it's left open, if you have a newer fridge, um, or even the sound of your phone ringing. For some people, this is not an imagination. My story was a bit different. When I was in grade 11, my little brother, who was a very healthy child, fell ill. We rushed him to the doctor, and we found that there was liquid buildup in his brain. You know, it's a very tough thing to, to take as a family. But what was even worse was that the doctors came to us after a few nights at the hospital and they said, unfortunately, you have to go home and say goodbye to your child, to your brother. Fortunately, this was not the case. My, fa my brother is, in fact, alive. But we were introduced to a new reality. My brother is now disabled. He's got a limp on his left leg and he's got a slight bend on his left hand. So he was, he was left-handed when he was born. So he, watching him try to eat using a fork or a knife was very difficult. He had to relearn how to speak. Watching him try to run with other kids in the sports field was very difficult. But above all, the most heart-wrenching moment for me was at a parent-teacher evening when a teacher said, we need to move him to a school for slow kids because she's not equipped to deal with him. We've been teenagers. I'm sure you remember how horrible it feels to be you know, turned back at a place because you look too young. Imagine being turned away because of a disability that you didn't choose. It's very challenging, but it doesn't have to be. And this brings me to my first point. What is accessibility? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word accessibility? Is it an entrance into a building? Is it maybe a ramp for wheelchairs? Or parking spaces for the disabled at the mall? I'd like to challenge this idea. What if I told you that each and every one of us in this room have been and are likely going to be disabled at some point in our lives. Well, you see, accessibility is not about disability. Accessibility is about experience. When we build our products, our services, or even design our environments, are they accessible? Is BBD accessible to blind employees? Is your coffee shop accessible 
to everyone in your community. Accessibility is when everyone, and I mean everyone, can fully experience our products, our services, and our environment. So now that we know what accessibility is, who is affected by accessibility? Well, according to the World Health Organization, a whopping 15% of the world's population lives with one form of disability or another. These are people who can't see properly or at all, people that can't use some of their limbs, people who are using, trying to use cell phones, are trying to use our website, but they don't have the same physical capabilities as us. 15% doesn't seem that huge until you realize that over a billion people in the world, over a billion people are likely excluded from your product when you don't consider accessibility. Well, again, find a billion people, but there's still the other people in the world, right? So maybe we don't, as a business, have to focus on those people, but we focus on Internet Explorer. <laughs> And there are way a lot less people using Internet Explorer in the world than people who are living with one form of disability or another. But, like I said, disability or accessibility is contextual. It is not about having a permanent uh, disability. Sometimes our disabilities are very momentary. Sometimes they're very temporary. Sometimes they're, they're enforced on ourselves, and sometimes they're not. Consider the man who can walk properly, uses something to help him. Or well, for this guy, an automatic door is a great tool. It's a very accessible thing to do. But consider the guy trying to be a hero and move all his groceries from his car in one go. Suddenly, a product that helps someone who is unable to operate a door helps a guy who's decided, I don't want to make many trips. So when we think about accessibility in our products, we ultimately design better products. Think about women walking in hills. While it's a mystery for us as men as to how they keep their balance, they seem to be able to do it fine on a flat surface. But when the context changes, it's not so easy or as pleasurable. So we need to think about our environments, we need to think our products and about the context in which we might be making something inaccessible. So why is it important for businesses to care about making sure that products are in fact accessible? First of all, it's the right thing to do. We should aim to include everyone when we design our products. We should aim to reach everyone who is interested in using those products. When we design products, we're solving a specific problem, and we'd like that problem to be solved for anyone who is in the situation. But, you know, for businesses, other people are doing it. In fact, they're standards. W3C have, have come together, they've created something they called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which other businesses are using to make sure that they reach as many people as they can. They're not only doing this for compliance, it's great for business. The more people you can reach, the more money you make. So they've come up with four things. One of them is that content needs to be perceivable. Well, it seems easy if you, if you have perfect eyesight, if you can see just fine, of course web content is perceivable, we can see it. But think about a person who's blind. Is your content actually perceivable to the blind? Or even someone with a color blindness? It needs to be operable. We create products so that people can use them. So the second principle is that people need to be able to use your product, regardless of their disability. The third one is that it needs to be understandable. It needs to make sense. It, as, as I go through this, it becomes a bit way more challenging for you to, to think about it. I mean, like, just simply close your eyes and try to use your phone. 
Close your eyes and try to use your website. Close your eyes and try to do banking, transfer money to your child who needs it instantly when you can't see. But the last one is web content needs to be robust. What this means is that it shouldn't break existing technology. Because newsflash, assistive technologies have existed for a very long time. And they continue to exist today and they continue to improve. When, as a business, we don't consider accessibility in the products that we build, we break this technology. Not only are we not considering other people, we're actually breaking the technology that is there to help them. So web content needs to be robust. But again, you reach more users. When we reach more users, we bring more people into the conversation. I'd like to see by a show of hands, how many of us in the room suffer from some sort of color blindness? Okay. I suspected that might be the case, but in other environments, there's actually way more people who have color blindness. But if we have designers in the room, we like to use color to communicate meaning. But are we thinking about other people? If you look at the first image, which is someone with no more vision, that's how they see that image. But the one directly below it, that's someone with a red color blindness, protonopia. Suddenly, your red, which you're using to showcase BVD, doesn't mean anything to someone else because they can't see it. Again, there are way more people in the world with visual impairments than the people who use IE. <laughs> but we consider those guys, right? Think about a tool that we all love. We either love Jira or we love Trello. Simple. And for those of us who use Trello, color is something that we use to communicate different meanings. Trello labels could be used for anything. They could be used to communicate the importance of a ticket, but they could also be used to communicate the different phases that a ticket is in. Someone with a color blindness, this means nothing to them. This is an actual problem that Trello sought to solve. And the solutions are actually quite right in front of our eyes. They use textures. It doesn't break the, the use for the primary user, if you can consider them, or someone with perfect vision. But just by thinking a bit more, innovating a little more, or thinking first about the excluded, they've included more people into the conversation. So, when we consider accessibility, we innovate. As a technology company, we'd like to solve a lot of the world's problems. And one of them that is in front of us, that can make us competitive, but also make us, help us uphold other people's basic human rights, is accessibility. Consider the Xbox accessibility controller. I don't know how many of you in the room are familiar with this, but if you look at it, the guy, in, I mean, the controller in the middle replaces all the ones around it. As a programmer, I marvel at the amount of work that they had to, re to rework on their code base just to support this. It's a controller that allows anyone to interact with it however way they choose. I challenge you after this talk to go and just go on YouTube, look up the Xbox accessibility controller. Kids with different abilities or disabilities are interacting with games using voice. Kids who don't have arms are interacting with this. It, it, it's amazing to see. It's amazing how much we can innovate when we think about accessibility. But now we know what accessibility is. We know who is impacted by our accessibility features, whether implemented well or implemented wrongly. What are some of the things that we can do soon as we get out of this place to make sure that our products are, in fact, accessible? As BBD, we've started to roll out videos for marketing. As developers, we have videos in our apps. We have videos on our websites. Something as simple as adding closed captions. 
help someone else be able to, be, to consume your content, to be able to use your product. So let's do that. Something else, we like to use images to communicate meaning. It's, you know, um, before this talk, uh, someone texted me and asked me, why do, we, why do developers like to post um, pictures of cats in their presentations? We like posting cats on our websites as well. But someone else who can't see that cat would also like to be part of the conversation. Something as simple as adding something called alt text for the non-programmers in, in the room. Alt text is used for two things. Number one, if your image doesn't load, this is a text that will be loaded on your screen. So if you can't see my dog, well, this picture that didn't load because of your internet, that's a picture of my dog. But also, this is helpful for assistive technologies. Consider someone who can't see the picture of the dog because they have a visual impairment. The screen readers can announce this to them. In front of you is a picture of VT's dog. It seems like something we don't need to consider. I've seen as developers, uh, well, I'm guilty as well. When I started, I just used to put anything in there or leave it empty. But something as trivial as going to add the description of what the image is, is actually helping you reach or helping us reach a wider audience. For those of us who started writing HTML in the early 2000s, something we used to abuse is called table tags. Even for the BAs in the room, I'm sure you've tried to write some HTML at some point in, in your life, whether it, it was just for fun or it was, you know, just to gain the experience. Early on, and it still happens today, people used to use table tags to lay out their websites. When you do this, you break the accessibility features that are built into HTML. While it might be easier for you, making it very difficult for someone else to be able to interact or even use your product effectively. Inversely, people are starting to use div tags. For those of us who know, I, I, I hope I'm not being way too technical with my HTML. <laughs> are using div tags to display tabular data. No, this is in fact inaccessible. So, Let's think about it next time. Let's use table tags to display table of data and div tags to display something else. Number four, tab navigation. Who knows what tab navigation is and who uses tab navigation? I see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have mouses. And that's how you say it. It is computer mouses. Um, if you have a form on your website and your first input is your, your first name, and the second one is last name, and the third one is age. When I press tab, and I'm on the first name one, it's supposed to go to the same name one. And when I press tab again, it's supposed to go to the age one. When I press shift tab, it's supposed to do the reverse. It's important to make sure that our products are used this way. Why? Some people just don't like using a mouse. Some people, don't have mouse, believe it or not. Some people forgot the mouse at home today and they still like to be able to use your website. So it's one of the things that we need to look at. But something that I was ignorant to until I started spending more time on YouTube trying to figure out what this thing is, is something we call ARIA attributes. If you've written a website in the last five years, You've probably seen this somewhere and have probably ignored it. For those of you who are copying, uh, who are copying the, the, the HTML from other people's websites, you've seen them include this in their websites and you've ignored it. What at ARIA attributes are is a way to help the browsers interpret your product. Like I said, at first, HTML is accessible by default. So what happens is, when your page loads, your browser creates something it calls an accessibility tree. An accessibility tree is how your browser is able to make sense of your website. The visual cues that you get because you're perfectly sighted, 
the browser tries to help someone else who's not by using the exact same, try to get to the exact same visual cues that you get, but now announcing it to those people. And again, W3C has come together again and said, we need a way to help out, and they've come up with what they call ARIA attributes. ARIA attributes come into play when we try to be cool and use custom components that are not, in fact, accessible. So if you use a checkbox, what uh, a screen reader will try to do is say, it's a checkbox, it's checked, and maybe even announce a label. So is it gender, uh, I mean, keep me logged in checkbox, checked. So that's how someone with a visual impairment hears it. But as soon as we start using buttons to communicate different meaning, we need to be able to, again, help the browser understand what the context is. So something that might be announced simply as just a button, we can add more context to it and say that this is a menu button. Surprise, surprise, this will not change how your control works. It actually, you, when, when a website is accessible and when it's not, there is no telling when you look at it. But it's important because someone else who's using a screen reader to navigate your website might not be able to know that the button that you put on the screen is a menu unless you, you tell it. So I'm running through a few of this. The other one is labeled by. I mean, these this people have come together and they've found a way for us to help reach a wider audience with minimal effort. So the same way I was able to say a button is a menu, giving it that context, so it will be announced as menu. You can, again, go and um, label a group of, 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 of items. So the browser will actually read this to someone as drink options water, tea, coffee, cola, ginger ale, and water is selected. You can imagine how something that takes seconds for you to go and do, how helpful it becomes for someone else who can see. Another one is owns, uh, which allows you to create parent-child relationships uh, between your components, even when physically uh, in, your, in your code they are not parent-child. So you can use other uh, content on your product to describe something else. But think about how many times have you entered your password wrong and you saw something that says password is required, or please enter a password, or incorrect password entered. Imagine how a screen reader tries to interpret this. For you, the visual cue is there, the red is great. I mean, it's directly under the box, so it means that it belongs to that box. But for someone, again, who can see, that's not obvious. So describe by is, again, a very simple way to say this content over here. Whatever is inside it describes the state of another component. Another one, one of my favorites, uh, because at first when I was preparing for my talk, I didn't really know much about this one. And when I looked it up, I thought it was quite amazing. Think about scrolling down a list of items. I mean, we like to use drop downs. Have you considered how a screen reader tries to interpret this to someone who's visually impaired? This area position inset means in this list, first of all, there are two. If you look at the screen, there's a set size and position inset. Set size says to the user how many items are in this list. So a screen reader will be able to say there are 100 items and this list that is scrolling through. And the current item which is selected, which is banana, is item number five. There are way lot more area attributes which I encourage everyone to look through. Um, it's very well documented, very easy to, to understand. And I think it's important for you and I to go and educate ourselves about this so that we can make sure that our products are in fact accessible to everyone. But most importantly, please keep in mind that no ARIA at all is way better than bad ARIA. <laughs> One of the things that we sometimes get wrong and makes no sense to me is having 
high contrast between our background and our foreground. There are tools out there that helps us to do this. Sometimes the choice of colors, especially when you're not a designer, it's very difficult. There's a freely available tool, it's a contrast checker. Again, if you see the WCAG, those are the people I spoke about, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So before we sign off our content, let's go and test it out. This tool allows you, it's freely available, allows you to choose your background color in your foreground color and it tells you whether you're going to pass uh, the accessibility um, rules that are there. For small text, for large text, and also for text uh, that's in front of graphical uh, images. But conversely, it also tells you if you fail. I mean, we should all know that yellow in front of white is a very bad choice, but we do it anyway. Tool is freely available and there's more like it to make sure that, I mean, if you look through the web, there's a multitude of products that people are building and making freely available just to make sure that you and I can reach a wider audience when we create our product. It doesn't matter if it's a small app. Can anyone use it? When you think back again to the beginning about someone who has lost their hearing, someone who's lost the ability to see, or someone who's lost the use of their arms. Are they able to interact with your product? Are they able to use your product in the way that you intended? There's a company, and I swear I'm not a cult follower of it, um, even though it might seem like it, who has considered accessibility from the very beginning. And I'd like to share with you a little video about it. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, tall face, focus lost. And you can start the day bright and early. can take a trip to somewhere new. Three miles to the summit. You can concentrate on every word of the story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. I chose to do this talk. The reason why I took my time to try and understand it a bit more, it didn't start because of escape, it started a while ago. Because I wanted to understand what are the challenges that some people face in using the products that we build. When we're busy chasing timelines, you know, deadlines are tight, uh, sometimes people believe that Accessibility is expensive. Some people even believe that accessibility is difficult. But I chose to do this talk because accessibility is important. Accessibility is a very big privilege, but it is also a massive responsibility because accessibility can be the difference between you making sure that someone else feels included but it can also be a way to uphold the human rights. The world is evolving, and so should the way that we build our products. With this talk, I hope to challenge the idea that design 
is only a tool used for function and beauty. But that design is our responsibility to make sure that everyone feels included. Thank you.